Welcome to Recalculating Small Business. Like its award-winning book, Recalculating is dedicated to small business in America. Your hosts are Don Mazella and Dan Perkins. Don Mazella is the editor-in-chief of the Small Business Digest. Dan Perkins is a registered investment advisor with 43 years' experience in managing money. Dan Perkins here, your co-host, along with Don Mazella of Recalculating for Small Business. Our radio program is dedicated to you, helping the small business owners increase their profits. We draw our name from Recalculating, voted the best small business book of 2017 by the Independent Press. In this book, it features ways to grow your small business. Now, here's Don Mazzella. Welcome to the program. I I just put in our notes, Jack is here to talk about how small business leaders can avoid being screwed this Christmas season. And uh, uh, we, only because you're such a fascinating guest. Uh, tell us a little bit about your background, then uh, some of the things that you you think uh, a small business owner and anybody should do to avoid being viewed as a Scrooge this Christmas season. Well, thank you for inviting me on your show. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, I'm a business consultant, and I have a Ph.D. in psychology. And one of the big problems I've discovered in the business world is how many people uh, are uh, lacking full engagement in what they do. It's like they don't really like their jobs that much. They just try to get through the day. Um, they don't enjoy the companies they work for, and it just seems like a huge problem. So I've, I've written a book called The Circle Blueprint that addresses that problem. And one of the issues that's come up is the issue of how do employees use giving uh, to either incent their employees, to engage their employees, or and sometimes it backfires and they and it, it creates more problems than it, it solves. Well, that's a start. But uh, uh, tell me, how do I avoid not being a Scrooge to some of my employees? You, you had something in your email to me which I thought were fascinating. So, so can you give us some thoughts? Certainly. Well, one of the things that companies are doing that they probably shouldn't do is they're cutting back on uh, giving to their employees. And w one of the most important things they can do is show appreciation. And so there are a few ideas that I have that uh, I think can be – There, some of them are creative, and uh, none of them are expensive. So one thing that employers can do is they could just host a luncheon potluck. Uh, it's an easy thing to do. It doesn't really cost anything. You wouldn't ask your employees to each bring a dish. But employees really enjoy the opportunity to get together, maybe set aside an hour where they can just have a social time and enjoy each other's cooking. So that's a great idea for employers uh, who want to do something to celebrate the holidays, but they don't have much of a budget. But another one, another idea, second idea, is to encourage employees to donate to a charity. Often employees will either come up with their own, you know, they can uh, vote and come up with a project they want to do as a group. And then uh, as they contribute to that project and the company can throw in some of its own money, and people have a great sense of accomplishment that they've made a difference and they and they've used the holiday season to good purposes. A third idea is to get something for the office. You know, it's often uh, really helpful that when you ask employees what they would like and the company is willing to kind of donate a new piece of equipment, a new coffee pot, a cappuccino maker, a, you know, uh, water bottles. It can be a fruit. Um, massage chair. There are all kinds of things that would make life a little easier for employees. And just the fact that the boss notices and is willing to make a contribution, uh, it can be a, a gift that lasts for a long, long time. Okay, so one last idea is just show appreciation. And a boss can do that by uh, writing thank you cards and just pointing out something that each employee has done uh, over the past year that was special and that, and uh, or uh, if you don't really have too many people to write cards for, you can just stop by people's desks and just engage them in a thank you and uh, show some kind of appreciation that goes a long way with people. So those are four ideas. Well, they're really interesting. Uh, um, and I know Dan can follow up. So, Dan, it's all yours. 
Thank you, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I, I, I like where you're headed in that that uh, individual individual gifts, and what I mean, the coffee maker or a new soda machine or whatever, those individual gifts that everybody can partake in uh, can be meaningful because uh, it says to the employees that the employer has some concern about the quality of life and the quality of the environment that they're working in. Uh, having uh, organizations um, get involved in charity events. Um, our men's group at our church is trying to collect shoes for homeless veterans. It's difficult for a veteran to get a job if their shoes are, are atrocious and, uh, uh, and so we're trying to find work boots and dress shoes and tennis shoes so that soldiers can go out and homeless soldiers can go and find a job. And it's, you know, it's a cost of a pair of shoes. Um, and then we have a collection Wonder. barrel at churches and, and, you know, churches and grocery stores and, and golf courses. And uh, we're getting shoes from everybody and, uh, and, and identifying a need that the community can a community of employees that can circle around and take ownership of so that it becomes their project, not just the company's project is a great way to be build spirit, not only at Christmas, but any time of the year. It certainly is. Um, is that there, there are some people that I've, I've seen studies that say that, once an employee gets to the point in terms of income that they can pay for their basic necessities, dollars of income mean drop dramatically on the list of what makes you a satisfied employee. And so obviously we could all use more money, but if we, if we take the pressure off being able to pay the house payment or the mortgage payment and the car payment, and we have a little bit of money left over, we feel much differently about giving and um, and so that uh, being in a position to share some of your wealth on a group basis uh, it actually takes away the embarrassment maybe it's only a few dollars that you can give but if you've got 15 or 20 employees all of a sudden you can multiply that if they just give a, a few dollars um, there could be a significant amount of money that can be given to an organization to help homeless people or the poor or hungry or whatever. Um, so, but that doesn't that take leadership on the part of the company to make the decision that they want to do something? It does. You know, I've, I'm familiar with the research you're referring to. And uh, one of the things that the research points to is that people have a, a longing for a sense of purpose in their life. And a company mm -hmm. can uh, can really tap into that and create a sense that we're doing something more than just making a product. We're also trying to make a difference. And I think when an employer is wise, they'll understand that part of human beings is a very valuable part for you to feed. Because the stronger it gets, the more people are engaged, the more they bring their creativity to what they do. And like you said, it doesn't require a lot of money. It's mostly about just being part of something where you're making a difference, a positive difference. Mm -hmm. Because it's the community that's working together more than just one individual doing something. And that's right. where you get People, just like with the hurricane relief in, in, in Florida and in Texas and Louisiana this past year. Um, it was amazing to see how many organizations that people came to the aid of their fellow Americans, and uh, not for pay, uh, just because they wanted to help. And we have yeah, I think people people are looking for those Go opportunities, and good good leadership provides those opportunities. I, I think you're absolutely right. We don't need natural disasters in order to find good things to do for people. <laughs> no, the opportunities are around us everywhere, aren't they? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. One of the things I'm curious about is um, the the movement, and and, and uh, I want to say this is just one person's opinion, so uh, take it for what it's worth. Um, the, the, there is a 
a growing secularism in our country, uh, which means diminished uh, spirituality. And, uh, and I wonder if the diminishment of the spirituality has an impact on who decides that they have some responsibility for their fellow man. Well, you know, I, I would really like to start at the beginning, I think, which is uh, inviting people to take responsibility for their circumstances and for their life. You know, it seems so common these days to want to blame somebody for your circumstances or for your situation instead of taking ownership that this is my life, whatever it is, and whatever I've been given or whatever I have not been given, and it's my responsibility to shape it into something that's valuable and useful and something I'm proud of. It seems like if we could get people to take that first step, we'd solve a lot of problems. As somebody once said, to those that much... To those that much is given, much is expected. Right. And that isn't necess- doesn't necessarily mean money. If you are blessed with talents and abilities, are you sharing that talent and ability with other people to make their lives better? Right. And in my book, The Circle Blueprint, I ask people to consider what their dream is, what, what's important to them, and is it a dream worthy of their life? And so many people have small dreams and not, not big dreams that stimulate them to try harder or take on more risk or learn something new or develop themselves as human beings. So when you say so small, small issues, small things, can you give us a specific example of what would be a small thing in, in your book? Yes. Like uh, an example might be, let's say there's some kid who's working at McDonald's and their only vision of what they're doing is to make some pocket change. Well, soon they learn you know, how to flip hamburgers and then they're bored and then they probably start you know, talking to other people there or messing around and get in trouble. But if you could have a conversation with that kid and say, you know, you could be a manager – and the kid goes, no, you know, there's no way I could be a manager. And you, and you really could talk to them and create, expand their dream. Yes, you could be. And get them to believe that's possible. Well, the very next day that kid comes in and he's dressed differently and he's asking different questions. He's trying to build a relationship with the manager. He's learning new skills. Just because he expanded his dream just a little bit. And if you get, could get him to dream a dream about owning a franchise – now he's got to think about how do I know, get to know some high net worth individuals? How do I get recognized by corporate? I mean, everything changes when your dream changes. And that could be a dream about your marriage. It could be a dream about your work. It could be a dream about your health. It, or the difference you, you're making in the world around you. Do you think America dreams anymore? Uh, not much. What I, I think all I don't know I think all great people uh had great dreams, and it seems we're focused more on blaming somebody than on creating something great so the, to be victims. The, yeah the the founding fathers had tremendous dreams tremendous dreams right and dreams create and, energy to change mhm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, but what do you think changed that made us uh, start to lose our dreams? Was there a particular event or time or a series of events that made well, us I not mostly, want to dream anymore? Yeah, I usually think about this in terms of individuals, not in terms of movements or society. But mm-hmm. but I do think it's, it's dangerous when you um, – when you sow the seeds that people will be taken care of by someone rather than need to take care of themselves, I think that undermines people's dreaming. Uh, give you me an example. That? Well, I'm trying to think about that. I, I guess I need an example, if you, if, if you can come up with one for me. Well, I think so an I'm, example might, might be if, I can, if, the, if the government will pay me whether I work or not, why, why mm-hmm. should I work? Why should I work? 
And so instead of dreaming a dream about what productive things I could do, it's easier just to stay home and get a check. But it doesn't so change me to do that. But is that, is, is that an example of ex- accepting personal responsibility or is it a lack of dreaming or both? Uh, I think it's both. I think we just make it easier for people to not have to dream a dream. Dan Perkins here from Recalculating.biz with your featured book. I want to tell you about a recent interview I had with Bob Bethel, a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business. Bob's new book is Strengthen Your Business, Fail Proof Strategies for Small Business. He tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Bethel's book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. Dan Perkins here with your Recalculating Small Business tip of the day. Did you know that a candle can be an energy saver for home and office? An old-fashioned candle can be a new-fashioned energy saver and at the same time provide a warm glow to any home office. Adding a candle seems like a silly thing to do, but it can help check for drafts. You can use the candle to test if new windows are needed. Here's how. First, take a roll of blue painter's tape and tear off pieces and put them on your left arm. Pass the candle around the opening and mark the spots around each window and door where the candle flame flickers. When you have finished your test, step back and see if you have tape around all of the window or only one side. The more tape you have on the window, the more money you will save by replacing those windows and doors. Check out Recalculating.biz for more useful small business suggestions. This has been Dan Perkins with your small business tip of the day. I was curious as to whether you thought it was the government providing everything for them took away the initiative and the desire to want to try and succeed and to dream. When the government replaces and you built generation after generation after generation where the government was taking care of everything, Maybe the government is the ultimate culprit here. Yeah, I I don't really want to assign blame, but I do think, you know, I I try to help people become aware of entitlements. I think all of us have entitlements, you know, entitlements for how uh, how my wife ought to treat me, entitlements, how my kids ought to behave, entitlements for traffic on the highways. But but entitlements really set us up for uh, frustration and uh, don't really open us up to many possibilities. So I think for people to be aware of that and to take responsibility for whatever occurs rather than expecting entitlements is is a fundamentally sound psychological uh, foundation. So um, could could we possibly use another word in that you talk in terms of entitlements I wonder if it's people feel for the way they have lived for generations, they have now become entitled to, as opposed to entitlements. That could be, and that would be even worse, wouldn't it? Go ahead. I have four four big ideas in how a person expands their life and moves toward greatness. The first one I call independence. But by independence, I mean uh, you've got to give up trying to please other people and you've got to radically commit to being your unique individual self. And it's so hard to do that because, you know, we're trained from childhood to please people to get along. And then the expectation is if I'm, if I do what you want, that you're going to somehow take care of me. And I think if we can throw that off, we move toward maturity. So that's the first step. The second Mm -hmm. step I call power, the second step I call power And power I define as finding your unique gift. I believe everybody's got something that they are uniquely gifted to do. And when you discover that, you know what you ought to be doing for a living. It's the thing that you'll be best suited to do. You'll find the most satisfaction. You'll be the most productive. 
So I have a process for people to discover what that unique gift is. I think it's hard to do until you've mastered independence because you're really hiding your uniqueness rather than seeking your uniqueness until you've mastered it. And then the third step is sometimes when people find their power, they become so arrogant that they're hardly, uh, you can hardly be around them. So the third step is humility, which to me means you lose your ego and you experience your oneness with humanity. And the last one is um, purpose, which I define as uh, developing spiritual eyes so you see your life in, in the largest possible context and you understand the value of spiritual things that put material things in their proper context. Fascinating. So the last one is the, the quote, the materialistic society that we can be happy with material things when in fact we really can't. Well, it's so fascinating to me. I, I ask many successful people, what's the, what's the most important thing they have done in their day? And then after they tell me, I say, you know, I imagine the most important thing you did today was kiss your spouse goodbye. And they all acknowledge it's true, but no one thought to say that. And I point out to them that, you know, the kissing your spouse goodbye, you didn't notice that or linger over it, but, but it's, that's about love. And you can't buy love, you can't sell love, you can't store love. Love is a spiritual thing. So is beauty and honor and generosity and kindness. And when you cultivate the ability to see those things clearly, it, it puts the rest of life in a different context. Right, right. I agree. Don, anything Man, else? Yeah, I, I'd like to jump in and throw a, a left field question at him, uh, at, at our guests, because uh, I, I know he's thought about it. Um, and it's a topic that's much in the news, um, which is uh, smaller companies um, haven't yet been hit with the harassment issue as much as large companies, but it's coming there too. Um would you want to comment? Uh, we can take. Uh, would you want to comment on on harassment and and what its uh, the effect it will have on the work workplace over the next couple of years? Well, I think it's a complex and and really difficult issue because I I know there are people who are real predators who use their power to to really take advantage of people in a weaker spot and and those people ought to be. Uh, punished for that and and people who are victims should be protected but but then I also know that that uh, everybody makes mistakes and I think it's unfortunate when uh, people who have made mistakes uh, can't be forgiven and may be treated with a little more grace and kindness I do think it makes it hard in the business world it's so hard to legislate these kind of things and I, I don't know where it's going to head as far as uh, what it's going to do to the business community. Dad, let me ask you this, though. Um, I, being an ethic myself and having grown up in a, in a world where ethnic jokes were, were just part of everyday life, um, do you also see this uh, as a changing moray? Um, I, you know, um, we had a guest on just before you that talked about not my job, but I can remember – my uh, editor at, at, at one of my first jobs, when I said I had nothing to do, he said, go wash the windows. If I told mm. a person to do that today, I, I'd be up there with a, a suit uh, uh, in, in less than a day. Uh, the world has changed. Would you want to make any comment on that? Well, I do think the uh, – I think social media is, is partly responsible that everything now gets aired in the broadest uh, – way in the world and and really the judgments of the popular uh social media it becomes a, the loudest voice it, it can condemn someone regardless of the facts and i think that's really quite unfortunate and, and i do think we've become more and more politically correct to the point where it's becoming a problem and will probably continue to become a worse problem hmm. i like agree what's going on in here uh, Dan, you get to ask the last question because we're running out of time. I know because we've got we've got another guest uh, coming. It's first of all, let me say it was been a pleasure listening to you and your philosophy. I think it's it's refreshing and clearly needed. Um, 
what do you think is the biggest challenge in, in, in your field? What do you think is the biggest challenge we're facing today as a nation? Well, I really don't think things are going to get better until we start waking people up. But I think people need to be awakened to the greatness within them and take responsibility to cultivate that. I think if that starts to occur, um, uh, things will move in the right direction. But until it does, I don't think anything's going to matter. Jack, your website for uh, our audience one more time? Yes, www.thecircleblueprint.com. Well, thank you so much, Jack. As, as usual, you're, you're such a great guest. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2hsa.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2 hsa.com that's to hsa.com dan perkins here from recalculating.biz with your featured book i want to tell you about a recent interview i had with bob bethel a turnaround specialist with lots of success in small business bob's new book is strengthen your business fail proof strategies for small business he tells us of his life successes and failures that have made him and his clients so successful. Over the years, Bob has brought 77 companies back from the brink and changed them into thriving, profitable businesses. His energy is amazing, and at 74, he proves that you can still have a great deal to give others if you just try. His suggestions are easy to understand and very helpful. One insight struck me was that most companies do not have a plan. The old Chinese proverb says, if you don't know where you're going, then any road will take you there, is true today. Bob Beth book, Strengthen Your Business, can be found at Amazon.com or can be ordered at your local bookstore. This has been Dan Perkins with your Recalculating.biz featured book. Welcome back to Recalculating, the program dedicated to American small business. Now it's time to bring together our two experts, Dan Perkins and Don Mazella, as they discuss things that are happening now that are affecting your business success. You know, Dan, uh, I'll look the year of 2017 is rapidly coming to a close. There have been a lot of momentous events, uh, so a lot of a lot of them good, some bad. But uh, I thought we'd spend a little time looking backwards and looking forward uh, today as um, it, last weekend of the year. Um, I'll start by saying I think uh, – uh, despite what the media has uh, been saying, I think uh, President Trump, by and large, has uh, accomplished two or three of the things he set out to do, one of, wh- one of which was to get the economy going, and two, to get the uh, uh, people uh, on a more positive frame of mind. Uh, we certainly uh, will, will have a new uh, Federal Reserve chairman. We will also have a, a lot of other changes. Uh, but in all in all, for small businesses, I think 2008 great year. But but how about I start with you and ask you what your thoughts are? Well, I agree that I think that 2017 has been a uh, a, a dramatic year. Uh, we we just came off of eight years of tepid growth, um, high unemployment. Uh, people leaving the workforce no longer are looking for jobs. And um, an America that a lot of Americans weren't very proud of. And Mr. Trump came in uh, in an upset over Hillary uh, and and took over the reins of the government and immediately began to work on fulfilling his promises to make America great again. And he felt that one of the ways to make America great again was begin to get rid of many of the regulations that were imposed upon business during the Obama years. Uh, we're now looking at uh, Goldman Sachs, who is projecting that the GDP growth rate in 2018, just around the corner, could well be 4% or higher. We haven't seen 4% gross domestic product growth in 
a long, long time. We'd have to go back probably to the first term of George Bush, uh, 41, or 43, excuse me. Um, I, I think that, that um, when we decided that we were going to change format and go from a pure political talk to, to try and build a program for small business, uh, what we saw, we started, I think, in, what, February or March, and um, in a period of uh, 10 months, we went from nothing to a substantial audience that continues to grow, and it's because of two reasons. One, I think it's because of the content, the quality of the guests that we have on the show, which is the result of your efforts, and two, uh, a genuine rebirth in the idea of taking risk and starting businesses. And uh, I believe that will continue uh, in 2018 and beyond. Um, the one thing that will be, one of the things that will be interesting to watch in 2018 is the midterm elections and how the growth in the economy might adversely impact the Democrats in terms of them uh, not only not gaining control of the Congress, but to continue to control what it is they have, or are they going to see their party diminish again in both the House and the Senate? Um, we, we, we have an unstable world. We still don't know what's going to happen with Mr. Kim in North Korea, whether he is ultimately going to attack the United States or some part of the United States or an ally of the United States. Um, major changes taking place in the Middle East with the shakeup of the royal family in, in Saudi Arabia a new king coming on board who's uh, perhaps more progressive than the, the, the previous generation, at least as it relates to div diversifying their economy and at the same time trying to provide more rights for women. Um, I, I think that uh, if I look back over 2017, uh, I look at um, probably one of the most devastating scandals in my recent memory, and that is what happened with the, not only Weinstein, but hundreds of other people who were involved on the Democratic side in, in, uh, in sexual harassment and, and, uh, uh, and rape and, and other things. And, and interestingly enough, how the Democratic Party turned on the, the beloved Bill Clinton uh, as they we're trying to defend the other Democrats in power. So it was a, a really a watershed year as to what the Democratic Party is going to look like going forward. Are they going to return to their, to their roots of blue collar, or are they going to continue to focus their energies on being the party of minorities and um, potentially lose more and more control and more and more seats in both the House and the Senate and continue to lose seats in the state legislatures. So it, it could be a very difficult year. We, we could have a scenario where the Democrats almost become non-existent by the midterm elections and the 2020 elections. Uh, turmoil is, is an issue. Uh, the markets have been fairly steady. We've not had any real significant corrections in the market. I mean, 10% or more. Um, and with the uh, a ro a robust economy projected by Goldman, uh, I would expect the stock markets to continue. So what does that mean? It means for our small business people that have IRAs or 401ks, if they continue to contribute to their retirement plans, they could see a significant increase in their net worth, not only in their business, but also in their retirement accounts if they're invested in the market. Those are just some of my thoughts. Well, um, there's a lot there to talk about. You know, I'd like to go back on a couple of items. You, you, um, uh, well, let's talk political for a moment. Then I'd like to go uh, the, back to our small business uh, audience. Uh, I think mm -hmm. the major uh, uh, upheaval from this uh, harassment scandal has been the uh, re reappraisal within the Democratic Party of Clinton uh, President Clinton's role and what he did. It was interesting. Uh, in the last week, the next to last weekend in November, um, there, were, there was an article on, in the Sunday New York Times 
by a Democratic uh, a columnist who said that uh, rereading the Star Report, of all things, realize, made him realize that uh, perhaps uh, impeachment was the, uh, the, the right thing for President Clinton. He said um, uh, the fact that they, they said it was a Republican uh, deal, um, uh, they managed to sweep it on, under the rug. But in, in light of today's uh, uh, accomplishments, um, uh, 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 events, it was it was necessary, uh, uh, in, uh, perhaps at that time, to have done something. And interestingly enough, uh, there was an anniversary affair that same weekend of, of Clinton's ascension to the um, presidency, the uh, president Bill Clinton's, and uh, the to- the main topic there was how uh, Hillary lost. Uh, which I thought was, uh, which the even the author of the New York Times article thought was uh, very um, very interesting. But w- what I find most interesting, as you know, I get a lot of material related to uh, small business across my desk, is the amount of uh, material from the Democratic Party, and particularly from Representative Velasquez who, by the way, I've invited to be on the program. Uh, uh, she is the ranking a Democrat in the Small Business Committee. And um, how now the Democrats are the party of the small business. I, I thought that was very interesting, never having seen a piece from them for so many years. But well, let's get off politics for a moment and talk about what, what this year some of our uh, guests have uh, had recurring themes. In my view, uh, what I see recurring themes is how important uh, who you choose to be your employees was almost as as important as financing, I, I, and how you treated your employees uh, as equally as important as important as the salary you paid them. I thought uh, uh, all of those uh, themes kept popping up in, with our guests. What do you think about that, Dan? Well, we clearly had a number of guests who talked about security because of all the hacking that's going on and uh, and uh, the importance of even small business. I think the the one thing that we hear, heard from most of the people who are in the cybersecurity area is that uh, in small businesses, you have to be concerned about employees stealing your data more so than the Russians or the North Koreans or the Chinese. Uh, and that, that was an important message because – I think that all of them were saying be more cautious about who you hire and what your security procedures are. And if you don't have them, get one of those companies to help you build a secure uh, database uh, and, and secure technology. I also think that we, we found um, opportunity abounding. I mean, we had people that had started businesses that probably other, most people had never thought of and, uh, and were, were being successful at them, whether it was turning grapes into candy or, or what it was. We found a lot of people who had an idea and uh, built a business and were selling. I think that the third thing that was really important that came across is how important – the internet is to the success of small business. Many of the people that we spoke to, whether they're doing uh, grapes into, into chocolate or, or, or cheeses or whatever it is, it was very important for them to start their business on the internet. And only after they had been successful and profitable on the internet were they considering the possibility. And considering is an important word, or whether or not they wanted to open a bricks and mortar. In many cases, they were looking for ways to partner with somebody else in the brick and mortar business to become a distribution point. But I think the, 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 the importance of the Internet was uh, something that struck me time and time again. Uh, you, you know, that's, that's a darn good, um, good point, Dan. Um, uh, but but you know the interesting thing about it the 
the number of new businesses, while uh, increasing, still has not uh, really um, gone uh, um, uh, into the roof or through the roof, but rather seems to be uh, um, a steady rise, but not a uh, significant rise. People are still um, opting for the uh, uh, the warm embrace of a big corporation. Uh, that's uh, one of the things I, um, I've noticed. You know, it, um, it was interesting. Uh, the, the the study that I thought was the uh, the funniest I had uh, seen in a long time. Seventy five percent of uh, graduates polled by this survey said they would like to go to a company that helped them pay off their uh, college loans. And I wrote mm. to the uh, author of the thing, and I said, "Duh." I mean, we all would like that, but um, uh, you know, the, uh, it's still. Uh, it seems to me, while it's a nice, attractive thing, what do you think other people within a corporation would think if these younger people got this added benefit? What are your thoughts? Well, you're, you're, what you're, if you're going to pay, if the company is going to pay off your student loans or assist you in paying off your student loans, that's profit that's coming out of the company that could be going to uh, shareholders in the form of dividends or capital to go to expand the business or compensation that could be paid, raises. So I think that the idea that we're going to spend corporate funds to pay off college. Now, I want to differentiate because I don't want people to be confused. There are many, many tuition assistance programs where corporations will help you advance your knowledge by paying for on successful completion of approved courses. That's different than just picking up and paying your your college tuition. So I, I think the idea of spending corporate dollars to pay off college tuition um, is is a difficult thing to consider when you when you consider. What does it do to the relationships of other people uh, that you're hiring or other people that are working there? I think it's a, it's a misdirection of corporate funds and would quickly find people looking for other work because they were clearly being treated unfairly. You know, that's the, you know, that's the interesting thing, thing, Dan. When I bring it up to people, that's the immediate reaction. Um, my wife had a thought. She said uh, perhaps corporations should um, say, here's a, uh, the amount of money we're willing to pay you for various uh, um, uh, fringe benefits. You, you divide that money up uh, any way you want, what you prefer and what you don't prefer. And, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, if you extend that idea, uh, the, the Department of Labor and other people, should really consider uh, such a flexible plan. It would make much more sense than uh, the, the, the a hodgepodge we have today. Well, I, I, there's a, there, there, whether it was successful or not, I don't know. But there was clearly one team that kept trying to work its way to the surface in 2017, and that's personal responsibility. Um, the, the young when President Trump was in China, he negotiated the release of three UCLA basketball players who were incarcerated for for shoplifting in three different stores. And the father of one of them said, "Well, what's the big deal? I mean, I live in Los Angeles; everybody steals. Where is the where is the personal accountability?" And I think that's what people were saying about the attitude that the father had with his son stealing and being arrested in China. Um, we, we, we have an issue. Should we, should we as American citizens be accountable for our actions or are we not? And I think that's one of the things that's happening uh, as a result of the sexual situation. You know, the Democrats didn't want to get rid of um, – uh, people in Congress. In fact, the, 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 I think the, the thing that, that surprised me the most and angered me the most is the fact that the Congress admitted that they'd spent $15 million 
in settling sexual suits. But that $15 million came out of mine and your tax money. And so I find it reprehensible that, that, that the government is spending taxpayer dollars, not only at the federal level, but the state and local. And look at the number of cases where we had teachers, both male and female, accused of sexual relations with minor children. Somebody's going to wind up getting sued. Who's going to pay for it? Either the insurance company with the premiums that the school board pays or out of taxpayer dollars. So I think it's, it's this whole personal, personal responsibility issue um, is an issue that was still bubbling to the top in the second half of 2017. And I don't know where it's going, but I do believe there is an issue of making sure that we understand that we have a responsibility, whether it's paying for our student loans or not stealing or killing people or not trying to cheat our bosses. We have a personal responsibility to act in a moral and a suitable way. And I think that that has got away from us. And there are a lot of people who seem to want to bring it back to the forefront. And I, I encourage that. Want to know more about health savings accounts for your company or yourself? Go to 2HSA.com and get a free employer's primer. Health savings accounts are a cost-effective way of offering health care benefits to your employees and yourself. HSAs build retirement funds for your employees, improve morale, and reduce your health care benefit costs. For a free employer guide to HSAs, go to 2HSA.com. That's 2HSA.com. Dan Perkins here for Songs and Stories for Soldiers with your veterans tip of the day. Did you know that the suicide rate for women vets is 12 times that of their sisters in civilian life? Did you know that one in four women vets feel uncomfortable about talking to people about their mental health issues? Did you know almost 600,000 women vets in America are suffering from PTSD? It's time to help. It's time for all of us to encourage our sisters, mothers, and wives to get help by contacting their local VA hospital clinic or community-based health care center. So if you know a woman vet that is suffering, go to va.gov and find their nearest VA facility. This has been Dan Perkins of Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us with your veterans tip of the day. T tell me, Dan, uh, tell me about your latest book. My recent or my current book that's coming out, I should say, is uh, Why Can't Grammy Remember Me? And it's, uh, it's really the first book written for children between the ages of 9 and 12 and their families. Uh, dealing with dementia. dementia. Dementia is a growing problem with the elderly in the United States and around the world. And we are very well, not very well informed about what's going on, what's happening. So I wrote this book in the form of a mystery. And I have two little girls, nine and 12, who uh, have a magical power to be able to seem to be able to find things that are lost. And so they go to their dads and moms and they say, you know, we really, we, we, we work all over the neighborhood helping people find things and we seem to find things. And their dad says, yes, you have a magical talent to do that. And they said, we'd like to start a business to see if we can help other people. So they decided to start a business. The two girls' names are Hudson and Charlotte. And they start H&C's Lost and Found. If you've lost it, we find it. And so they build a business, and they convince the dads to build them an office and a treehouse in the backyard. And uh, they get busy making posters and flyers trying to get customers. And their dads take them downtown, and they put them in the windows and on the telephone poles and light poles. And they go home, and uh, first week goes by, and nobody comes. And the second week and third week, and nobody comes. They're really, really dejected. And the fourth week comes, and... There's a knock at the door, and they walk over and open the door, and there's a young man standing there with one of their flyers in his hands. And he says to them, my dad says the reason why my Grammy can't remember me is because she's lost her memory. And your flyer says you find things that are lost. Can you find my Grammy's memory? Well, they don't know anything about memory, so they take his name and they go see their dads to see what can happen and the story evolves into how they learn about what dementia is and what's going on in the body when somebody has dementia 
and then they decide while they can't find their customer's memory, they can help him build the tools to retain her in his memory. And so at the end of the book, there are about 10 10 to 12, 13 things that families can do together to work on to preserve the memory of grandma and grandpa so the generations can know who these people were. Cool. And that's the story. What a great book. And when will it be available? And um, and how can people get it? Well, it'll be available on Amazon.com. A lot of people who have read it, uh, who've had moms and dads that have been stricken with Alzheimer's and dementia, uh, tell me that they really now begin to understand what's happening in Grandma's brain. And uh, we took a, a different approach. Rather than do the typical brain cross-section, we design, I work with the artist, and we design highways in the brain. And there's a brain of one of the little girls and the brain of Grammy. They both have highways, roads, but the other girl's brain, everything is green and go. Grammy's brain is full of no left turns, do not enter, stop, no right turns. So all of the messages that need to come from our brain get screwed up and we can't function. Great illustrations, though. Wonderful illustrations. Well, say goodbye, Dan. All right. Time for us to go. Thank you for joining us. And by the way, if you didn't hear all of today's show, you can go to recalculating.biz, and you can pick up this show and past shows uh, to expand your knowledge as becoming more successful entrepreneurs. Thank Thank you for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. Well, that brings brings up an interesting um, subject, um, uh, Dan. Uh, as you remembered during this year, my sister-in-law died, and um, but uh, I always commented about her small business really kept her on, um, and, and in fact created jobs for her to enable her to have something uh, to live for. And um, I was talking uh, this weekend with with someone. And we got on the subject of uh, small uh, small businesses have it more difficult, but tend to, to be more um, uh, flexible in helping people and kindness. And then, sure enough, in the Dear Abby column in our Sunday paper was the story of a wo- woman who said that she, uh, she she had developed cancer, and when she went to pay her uh, physical education bill. The um, the owner had uh, uh, canceled what she owed uh, and, and the gesture. Do you think that small businesses tend to have a bigger heart than large corporations? Yeah, I think they do because the nature of small business you can you can align yourself into a specific community or a specific activity. Uh, big corporations who have branches all over the all over the world or all over the United States. Um, they have to create structures to have somebody apply, and and so that that um, uh, we did a program just after Thanksgiving here in, in Florida. I just it just discovered a need that that we have two veterans hospitals up in uh, Tampa and St. Pete, and uh, there's a need. They've got 150 veterans in the homeless shelter there. They need shoes. Uh, we put it together very quickly a program to talk to our community through the newspaper through the churches about uh, doing a shoe drive, and and it was very successful. Uh, individuals can sometimes react more more quickly than large institutions, and uh, uh, and so if if a particular president of a small business uh, is involved in his or her community, they will tend to typically find ways to support activities in that small in that community that they're doing business in. Bigger companies, it becomes more institutionalized. And um, although some are trying to bring the opportunity down to the local community, the local branches, uh, to try and get them involved in helping in the, the community. But it's harder with a big business to have a sense of belonging and helping. Uh, much much easier for a small business like yours and mine to be able to help. Well, you know, I'm going to talk about a big, big business that, uh, ironically, the Wall Street Journal finally caught up with. Um, you know how I've, uh, over the years, said about the Hallmark Channel and its uh, 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 
steady diet of all American uh, truisms. Um, well, mm-hmm. uh, the, the Wall Street Journal uh, had a big article about the fact that the Hallmark Channel is the fastest growing channel of any um, any channel in the United States uh, in 2016 and now 2017. And it's um, it's a, a Christmas diet is a steady of diet of boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy finds girl in time for Christ for Christmas Eve. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, it, it, uh, I watch the programs. Uh, I can only stay. I call them, uh, from the old vaudeville term um, schmaltz. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and. Uh, you know, uh, in it, it, it uh, preaches the small town values, the values of small business, etc. But um, uh, and I, I feel that they're still alive and well in many places in the United States. And uh, uh, you know, we got to pat ourselves on the back uh, a little bit. You know, we've gone from nothing to about eighty-five thousand downloads for each show uh, uh, mm-hmm. uh, on the internet which uh, we're told are, are very good numbers. Uh, in fact, some say spectacular numbers. But um, uh, uh, and we tend to be uh, in the same vein. But what do you, um, if you had your druthers, if that's an old-fashioned term, what do you see for 2018, Dan, for us? Well, I... I uh... I think we're going to have more sponsors. There are going to be more people who are interested in the content. If you can continue to find the talent that you're giving us, I don't think we're going to go to 160,000 per show. Uh, I expect to see us continue to grow, but there's going to be a point of not so much diminishing the turn is that it is that the things that we would have to do uh, collectively to try and take this audience to another level meaning going to five shows a week. Uh, I don't know that I physically and emotionally can handle doing five days a week radio. I know as as many interviews as we both do, I can't imagine doing three hours a day, five days a week. Um, I, so. No, uh, no, 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 no one can. You know, we've had uh, for 30 years here in New York, we've had Mike Francesa. Uh, doing mm-hmm. uh, five hours a day, five days a week, <clears throat> and he finally called it quits earlier in December, um, admitting that the grind was too much uh, for mm-hmm. him. Uh, uh, what we have to do, I, I think, is get our audience more involved, and that's one of the things we're going to try to do uh, in 2018, figure some way to get them more involved. But we will ask mm-hmm. them uh, to, uh, if they have a moment, to to uh, send us um, anything they want, to, comments about the show, to uh, reco- editor at recalculating dot biz, editor at recalculating dot, dot biz. Uh, it'll get to us, and perhaps they'll give us the ideas to make our show show better in 2018. Yeah, I would love to have an audience tell us what would you like to see us talk about? What what are the things that you are of interest to you that we haven't covered that you'd like to have covered? We're always looking for input as far as content. And then we'll go out and try and find people to answer the question, deal with the content. But uh, you're right, we want more listener involvement in the program. And I think what we're going to try and do is try and come up with more special authors for listeners, discounts and special packages. Uh, that's one of the things I would like to be able to work on in 2018 is increase the value of listenership on the program. Well, with that note, Dan, I'm going to say Happy New Year and I look forward to uh, having our, uh, our audience back in 2018.
Yes, sir, I agree. Happy New Year to you, too. Thank you for joining us on Recalculating. We hope the information you received on today's episode was helpful to you in starting and growing your business. Please go to our website, recalculating.biz, to contact us, to listen to past shows, and see special offers. Until next time, remember, if you grow, we grow. Join us next week for more helpful ideas to make your business a great success. Recalculating, a program designed to help you be successful 